right, welcome everyone to the February 5, 2021 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. I'm your host, Jeremy Veldman. We got a full program for you tonight. A lot of information to cover. Very popular topic, astrophotography. Several of our members, as well as several of you watching, probably have an interest in this hobby. And we're hoping to give you some great information tonight. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. We get started. So just a few preliminaries here. First of all, we are the Memphis Astronomical Society and we are a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education and astronomy and related sciences. You can find us online on Facebook, Twitter, and of course we're on YouTube. If you haven't already, please take a minute to subscribe to this channel. Special shout out to the now almost 1700 subscribers or so to our channel. Thank you for stopping by. Hope you get a lot of value out of tonight's meeting. And our website, of course, is memphisastro.org. You'll find out more information about us and our organization, as well as several useful links on telescopes and anything else related to our organization, as well as, of course, a calendar of events. Not much new, although we are getting toward hopefully the tail end of things as we ride out the uh, COVID pandemic. That hasn't been our nemesis as far as observing is concerned. Officially, we're shut down, but it's, um, it's more cloud cover than anything else. Again, we're battling uh, iffy conditions again this weekend, but if we get clear skies on a normally scheduled observing event going forward, we're getting out. I mean, forget the, co forget the COVID, we're getting out, we're gonna observe again soon. So whenever the, whenever the clouds part and we get clear skies, we're going out. So. Keep an eye on your email for that. Um, speaking of which, we do have another virtual star party coming up later this month. And we've been doing these. Um, these are Tennessee statewide uh, virtual star parties that are, they're, they're not MAS hosted events. Um, the, the, lately, they've been hosted by the Dyer Observatory. The one coming up this month is actually hosted by the Werner Park Nature Center. And we did one back in July. They do one every six months or so. So we will be our participant in that event on February the 20th. So mark your calendars for that event. And some great news. I will not be the participant in this month's event. So if you're sick of hearing from me, you get a break from me this month. And our very own Ann Viano is going to be stepping in. And of course, Ann teaches physics and astronomy at Rhodes College, and she has access to the 20 inch planar wave telescope, I believe, and will be showing us some galaxies if the skies are clear. <clears throat> so yeah, we got this coming up February the 20th. You see the link there for the Warner Park Nature Center's YouTube channel. Be sure you check that out. Mark your calendars for February the 20th. That's I believe two weeks from now. And I will send an email, on, out, uh, email notice out regarding this as well. So that's our next virtual star party. And again, this is a statewide event, not just MAS, but Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society, Warner Park Nature Center, Bays Mountain Planetarium in East, in, uh, East Mem uh, Tennessee, Tennessee, sorry. So there will be several uh, people throughout the uh, state of Tennessee that are participating in this event. So that's coming up. Saturday, the 20th of February. Mark your calendars. If you're interested in joining our email list, the website is joinmas.com. Just enter your name and your email. We send out notices about once a week regarding events, whether they're regularly scheduled meetings or upcoming observing events. So go to joinmas.com if you'd like to be added to our weekly email distribution list. Now we got several new members and this goes back a couple of months. So I'm a little behind here, but wanna catch up and acknowledge several people that have submitted their applications that have been met with approval and wanna officially welcome them to the Memphis Astronomical Society. Now we do have a long standing tradition of the individuals who we announced to be new members not actually being present for the meeting. But since we have several people to announce, I like our chances tonight of having at least one person be here. So if I call your name, I'm gonna pause for just a second. And if you wanna unmute yourself and say hi so that we can welcome you, I'll start with Sandra Hanna, who was approved on December the 11th. Sandra, are you here tonight? 
Okay, well, welcome anyway. So that's one. Good to keep the tradition going. So far, so good as far as keeping the tradition going. Sylvia Walker, you were approved on January the 22nd. Sylvia, are you on tonight? All right, well, welcome anyway. Uh, welcome to the MAS. We're happy to have you aboard. So far, so good. Next, Scott Cutler. Oh, there you welcome. go. There goes your tradition. <laughs> oh, that's it. <laughs> All on. right, hand to Scott. Welcome to MAS, and I believe Scott is a professor at Rice University. Correct me if I'm wrong. That is correct. Computer science. Well, welcome. Yeah, you're a code warrior. So <laughs> excellent. We need we need more guys like you who can write code and, and develop software. So uh, we won't expect too much. Or we won't ask you to do too much. But uh, welcome to our group from Houston, Texas, I believe. Correct. Correct. Where it's where the skies are not exactly clear tonight. Well, welcome to the club. We haven't had many clear skies either. So. Anyway, we're, we're glad to have you aboard. Uh, Ke Kevin Turner, you were just approved this week. All right, well, welcome, Kevin. All right. And last of all, but not, not least, Bob McMahon, are you on? I saw Bob. I am here. Yeah. Uh, thank you very welcome. much. Welcome. Welcome, Bob. Welcome. Excellent. All right. Well, that makes two out of five, so that's not too bad, I guess. So welcome to the Memphis Astronomical Society. Happy to have everybody aboard as new members. Now for everyone on tonight, I will have Appreciate links. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. For everyone on tonight, I've got links to these two documents in the description. And that of course is the February sky chart. You uh, do get clear skies and want to get out and do some observing. And then also our membership application. So if you are interested in becoming a new member, just download that link. The uh, PDF is uh, already has fields that are pre-filled. So just type in your details and then email them back to us at info at memphisastro.org. And again, we've had several new members. Very happy to see growth and participation as we ride out these times. We will get back to live meetings again soon. We'll look for a link to these two documents in the description below this video whether you're watching live or, you know, again, watching the recording later on our, on our channel, on our YouTube channel. And when you become a member, of course, you get access to our newsletter, which is the Meteorite. And we've got several, several good pieces of information that come in our newsletter, such as astrophotography galleries, sky charts, minutes from our past board meetings, and then also articles that some of our, our members submit. So one of the perks of being a member is you get access to the, to the, the Meteorite, which is our newsletter. And I want to give a special shout out to Phil Mahon, who made a donation to the Memphis Astronomical Society a couple of months ago. And he wrote this letter to Mr. Rick Honey. And I'll just read it here. Here's a small donation to the MAS. Your organization sponsored my daughter's presentation on Does Humidity Affect My Ability to See the Stars? That was her eighth grade science project. It was about 10 years ago, and we're both still grateful. Please keep up, keep up the good work encouraging our youth to engage in real science using the scientific method free from the culture, cultural and political biases of the fear du jour. Take care and explore the heavens. Sincerely, Phil Mahon. Phil, again, thank you very much for your generous donation to our organization. And we will put those funds to good use to continue to grow and expand our reach. So thank you very much. So with that, we're going to go ahead and just jump right into our main program. Now we got a couple of people on tonight that have equipment that they want to demonstrate some, uh, some use. And then we've also got some, some questions that were brought in before, before we kicked off the meeting tonight. So we'll get to those in just a minute. But really, this is meant to be an open discussion, more or less. So feel free to chime in anytime if you're on live. Uh, if you want to enter your questions in the chat room or comments in the chat room, that would be great too. Try to get to everything tonight. But Rick, I know you have a, a, um, a demonstration that you want to do and I kind of weather dependent. So how are we looking on your end? 
Thank you, Jeremy. So quite amazingly, everything looks fine. Um, I called Jeremy last week and said, man, I'm just, you know, when I, when I had time, it was, it was cloudy. And when I didn't have time, it cleared up and I just wasn't getting this thing put together and, and we need to come up with another plan, but lo and behold, things kind of fell together today. And I have uh, some stuff I want to share with you. <clears throat> so back before Christmas, I got a, uh, uh, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna start sharing screen. So here goes, Jeremy. Let's see. I've just stopped sharing on my end. Okay. So this is my. <clears throat> you should see a PowerPoint uh, screen. Is that yes. what you got? All right. So I started uh, this whole oh astrophotography thing <clears throat> back in the late 90s uh, this was my telescope i started with 35 millimeter film and uh, i don't you know for the old people who've been around doing this <clears throat> we use hypersensitized film you take uh, film and soak it in nitrogen gas and uh, uh, make it uh, even more sensitive than it already was and go out and shoot a roll of it and keep it cold and get it developed and get it back and it looked awful and you do it again. And <clears throat> so uh, not didn't take me long before I thought, well, this might be for somebody else. I, I think I suffer from a mix of uh, ADD and OCD combined, you know, so um, I'll dive into something deep and then go, well, it's not, that's not any fun. <laughs> so, um, and I got hooked on, um, doing occultation timings and they do all that with video equipment. And so I got into video astronomy pretty quick. And that's what you see here. This was, uh, set up to, uh, let's see, that was, um, uh, Venus transit, I think, uh, that I, that this setup was for. And, uh, uh, and then I took everything and we went to Oklahoma one evening with this setup over here on the right that uh, uh, one is, what was the lunar prospector? It was one of the lunar satellites. They crashed into a crater at the South Pole of the moon and they wanted to try to capture any evidence of, 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 uh, water uh, in the debris or dust layer that was kicked up from that. So they asked amateurs to get out and record it. We did. We didn't see squat, but it was a fun trip. <laughs> Turned out the Hubble didn't see anything either, so I didn't feel too bad about it. Um, then I graduated to a Mallinckam camera. It was a color camera that was uh, more sensitive and actually did internal uh, frame stacking, a lot of nice features, but at the end of the day, the chip size was too small to suit me. What I, what my goal is, is not as much astrophotography. I mean, I will do some of that and play with it, but my goal is to be able to show people live in an audience what the telescope is looking at. <clears throat> and so this is my current telescope and uh, that I'm using for this and uh, the camera for it. I got, I decided I wanted to re replace the melon cam. So I got something with a, uh, was it APS-C uh, chip. So it's about the size, in fact, it's the same chip that's in my Sony uh, uh, DSLR. And uh, I got a small guide scope, but I got to reading about all this stuff and see I had, I had on this telescope, I had a, a USB three hub, power supply for it, uh, USB connections to the telescope, all the cameras. And I kept running into traffic problems over the USB to my laptop. And at that point I'm sitting there going, really, I don't wanna run two long USB cables here. This is what a hassle, blah, blah, blah. Uh, power distribution was getting a little out of hand. And then this, I saw this little box, that little square thing on top of the telescope. It's an ASI Air Probe. 
and they've taken a Raspberry Pi and added a power control module to it, put it all in a nice little aluminum housing and a, a whole bunch of really fine software to go with it. And it basically replaces my laptop. You can run everything with a cell phone. I happen to have an iPad, so uh, they don't have PC software for it. You do it with a, um, a laptop or a, uh, 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 what's the other stuff? If it's iPad. not uh, a what? An um, iPad. An iPad. What's the other one? Uh, the Google stuff. <coughs> Android. Android, Android uh, uh, tablets. So, uh, so anyway, that's uh, and and the first night out, you know, just playing with it in the driveway before I knew what I was doing. That was a picture I took, and I was like, "Holy cow! I can't wait till I figure out what I know what I'm when I when I know what I'm doing." So anyway, oh, and I'll tell you about battery stuff too. None of this stuff likes low voltage, and I've come up with a solution for that. If you get interested in battery tech, I'll uh, I'll do a presentation on that. But uh, let me switch now from here. Stop that. So my iPad is currently hooked up to my telescope that's sitting out in the driveway. So let me share that screen. <clears throat> All right. So uh, when it first starts up, you come to a, another screen that where you tell it what equipment you have uh, hooked up to it, or it tells you. Uh, and you can select what kind of telescope you've got, uh, what kind of mount you're controlling. I use the EQ mod uh, system uh, rather than using the handset for my uh, Orion Atlas, uh, I go straight to the uh, mount itself. Um, I don't want to try to back out to the screen because I have to reconnect everything and I don't want a chance losing that connection. So uh, this is basically what you'd come up to when you got started. This is the camera, uh, the main camera controls. Uh, I do have cooling turned on. I'm not sure I really need it. I'm not doing long exposures. Turn that off, just save some power. This is my guide camera. Uh, and I just got that to work the first time tonight. So really happy about that. It turned out it wasn't focused, that helps. Um, you can control a filter wheel and a focuser with it. Uh, I don't have either one of those. And you can uh, you store all your images either on the built-in SD card or a thumb drive. <clears throat> the Wi-Fi controller here, I don't trust Wi-Fi for interference reasons. So this is actually, I've run an ethernet cable out there to it. So it's running in a hardwired mode right now. But if you, you, you wanna start with say a polar alignment, right? So. You, First thing you do is polar alignment. And this is just more easy than you could ever possibly imagine. Uh, you just tell it to get started. <clears throat> I knew what plate solving was and I knew you could do it with images. It never occurred to me that, that you could do it live while you were uh, working on this uh, with the mount, let's see. Okay, so the next thing it's gonna do is, is rotate the mount um, about 60 degrees and um, I don't have a camera out there to watch it. I do have a ring doorbell and you can see it from my ring doorbell. <laughs> but it's dark and so you can just barely make it out. Tap the bolt. 
sorry. So now it's uh, shooting a picture. It's going to plate solve. It, and when it does that, it also calculates the focal length of the telescope. So all the math it does after that, it's not based on what you're, um, what you're telling it. It's uh, based on what it, how it's calculating it. So it's rotating, rotating. All right, so now it's uh, shooting. Uh, so it's calculated my uh, total amount of error is uh, one minute, uh, six seconds, and two minutes. So it's a little off. Um, good enough for me. I'm going to leave it at that because I'm not going to go out there and fix it. And we can go now to preview and you can capture a shot. And this is a, a 10 second exposure from the main camera. And you can see it's loading down here at the bottom. It's, uh, you know what, we, I think we've got clouds coming in. That's a little hazier than it was. So, <laughs> You can use uh, this software with uh, uh, Sky Safari. I haven't tried that yet, uh, but you can, uh, it's got its own built-in data set. So it's got, uh, you select tonight's best, my favorite stars. It's got the NGC list. It's got uh, the Cald Caldwell catalog, NGC, IC, uh, double stars, SH2 objects, comets, uh, sun and planets, all this stuff. But you can pick from any of these catalogs or just search for any of it. Um, turns out what's bright from my driveway and pretty easy to get a picture of is the Orion Nebula. And so I'm going to tell it to go to that. And this is what I've never had with a go-to mount before. You know, I've had, I've got plenty of go-to mounts. And when you get to the object, you know, you've got to manually center it yourself. Look through the IPs, get it centered, then tell it to sync up. Well, this takes pictures of it, does the plates off, and centers itself. And I didn't know it would do that when I first hooked this up. And that, that was... That is so cool. <laughs> that surprised me. So it's validating. Ah, I got it right the first time. So there it is. Yeah, we're getting on some haze in here. That's a little more washed out than it was earlier. Uh, that's a 10 second exposure. Uh, but there's uh, the nebula and Orion. I've got some, oh, and it, we got some, uh, I got some collimation problems. Oh my. Well, it, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a collimation issue too. Mm. It's off to one side. So I've got to work on that. But <clears throat> this is, uh, this has really been a whole lot easier to set up get started and get going without knowing what I'm doing than I would have ever guessed. Uh, you can combine pixels. That's what bending is and get uh, basically by doing that, you get more sensitive. Uh, you can get shorter exposures, but less resolution. Uh, you've got an auto run feature so you can. Uh, Are you guiding now, Rick? Uh, I'm not guiding now, but it will. Uh, let me. Let's see. Okay. So.
So this is the guiding function and it is guiding. And I ran this through calibration for the first time just before the meeting started. Uh, I had never gotten to this point before with it. So uh, uh, this is this is fun. I think that the star is too bright to guide with that. Do what? The star is too bright. It so is. So it, it doesn't have, it, it is flat on the top. So the, the, the system oh, can- Oh, I see what you're saying, right. Yes. So you, you'd want a, a dimmer star. A dimmer the, star, yes. I got you. Okay. Oh, but it's fine. I, I was just asking. <laughs> well, and, and like I said, uh, 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 the other night when I tried this, nothing worked because I couldn't figure out how to get my uh, uh, guide camera focused. I bought the little ASI camera to go with their uh, little 120. Uh, I mean, the ASI uh, guide scope to go with their 120 camera uh, just because it made a nice neat little package and uh, uh, it wasn't fun. it took me forever to get it focused so so that's guiding and uh, and what else can I show it's getting better the guiding yeah from what I understand, it will, of course, as it, as it yes. does, right? Yes. And then, uh, auto, let's see, where did it? So did it automatically pick that star to guide on? You said I, I had picked it earlier uh, okay. to run the calibration, so I think it remembered that, maybe. Yeah, it does pick, it. It does pick uh, a star. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah, automatically. So let's see. Uh, where did the? That's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is. Oh, live stacking. Okay. So so this will do live stacking. Um, let me shut that back down to ten. Um. And, and you can set it up to do a uh, lot your light frames, dark frames, bias frames, and uh, you can set it up to do an auto run so that basically you leave it alone and it'll, it'll sit here and go through all of your imaging uh, for you. I haven't ever done any of that, so I'm not uh, gonna try. I haven't had any luck with this yet either. It it doesn't seem to like the number of stars it's seeing to stack the images, but it's going to try to stack. Uh, not enough stars. Yes. Yeah, not enough stars. But only you may need to give more time. Yeah, and and more contrast. And I have yeah. no filters on this at all, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the next thing I need to start doing is getting some light pollution filtering and what have you. This is raw uh, first shots with it. So, uh, and it was just meant to be a, uh, uh, a brief demonstration of some of the capabilities of the... Uh, of the hardware, not of the operator. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't think your polar alignment's good. With your polar alignment being as bad as it is, I don't think your guide is going to be that that good. Probably You're not. going to have problems with it. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's an absolutely cool unit. Well, well the well, fact that it's all there in a box the size of a cigarette pack. I don't yep. know. Maybe most of y'all don't remember what that was you know cigarettes that came in a pack about that size I, so and you can't beat the cost yeah yes under 300 bucks you know it's just it's wow so uh that's my uh that's my latest set of toys and uh my adventure into uh into 
astrophotography for public demonstrations and stop sharing that screen. And uh, okay, we do have a couple questions that came in. And I'll go ahead and uh, read those. They're in the chat. And if anybody else has any other questions or comments, of course, feel free to chime in. So, Rick, the first one is, do you have the Atlas or the Atlas II? I have an older Atlas. EQG. Atlas e e Q a Atlas e Q G. That's what it is. Okay. It's an old model. Yeah. It's the same I have. Same as the one you have, Freddie? Yes. Excellent. And then a, you know, a question I had actually is uh, how much does your setup weigh? Because this could be a portable rig, correct? I mean, you could drag this to a dark sky site if you wanted to, potentially. You can. Depends on your scope at the end. The mount weights, um, uh, the tripod weights, like I would say maybe 30 pounds. The mount maybe 40, a little bit more, 45. But it's something you can you can move yourself. To. The the mount head itself is the single heaviest piece. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I bring to a lot of the the star observing sessions. Yes. So it's it, it's portable. You just have to kind of plan ahead. Yeah. Fortunately for my driveway use, I have it on a dolly that <laughs> just rolls out. Yeah, I saw that. I was I was trying to decide if I could sneak over to your house and slip away with it, but yeah, that'd be something I'd be interested in stealing too. And, and it's not for the metal. <laughs> oh no, it's for the weight. No, yeah, no, that, that's that's a nice setup. I, I did ask Rick about that, but he said it's it's more or less custom made, so it's not like they sell those in stock. Yeah, I bought that off of eBay from a guy in Pennsylvania, and it was like three hundred dollars. It was ridiculously expensive, but but it is well made. The only problem with it is, I don't like the design. It is, it's unstable. I mean, you've, um, the wheels are inside of the uh, tripod legs, yeah, and you want them out. You're moving it around, you it's easy to get the center of gravity over the over the wheels pretty quick and yes yeah so you just got to be careful with it when you're moving it yeah so really when you go from the from the uh, garage to the driveway there is always a step yeah. you gotta yeah. be careful there <laughs> right <laughs> i was gonna say the same hey, thing you can see, hey, you can see uh, accidents happening there yes yeah, steve uh yeah. have you tested the distance you can get on the wi-fi so that's okay. So that's another problem uh, with this little thing. Uh, you know, it does two uh, two point four gigahertz and five gigahertz. Five gigahertz, you better be within five or ten feet of the telescope to use that. It's you know they've the antenna for the Wi-Fi is on the circuit board and it's all wrapped up in a nice little aluminum enclosure. So yeah, it's, it's blocked. It's bad, basically <laughs> right. The 2.4 is not cage. bad. It's, you know, it'll, it'll get around 20, 30 feet. Uh, it gets a little uh, sketchy out around 50 feet. Uh, uh, Wi-Fi can see if right now my Wi-Fi is about, 50 feet from it and I wasn't going to trust it to stay connected to Wi-Fi. So that's why I ran the ethernet cable out there. But uh, the, there are a number of people, they, you can get a little uh, Wi-Fi hotspot to plug into the ethernet jack on it and have it right there as well. Uh, with a better antenna. Yeah, with a better antenna and, and better range uh the uh you can use one of the power ports to power it or something i'm going to uh, uh it's a hutu <laughs> what that's what it's called a hutu uh, uh yeah they might that's right that's one of them uh, the uh i'm going to use one of the power ports on uh on the little uh, ASI air controller to turn on and off uh, my green laser pointer so that when I'm when it's trying to go to something uh, 
I can turn that on. It's a high powered green laser pointer and it'll show what the telescope's pointing to in the sky. Uh, that's my next project. But uh, I was gonna show you something about that battery box I built. So I'm going lithium. Uh, Rick, before that, there is a question about the Raspberry Pi. Yep. Uh, the trick here is not the Raspberry Pi. Anybody can duplicate that. The issue here is the software that they developed oh, yeah. for the Raspberry Pi right. and it's copyright protected. You can hack it, but uh, uh, it will take a while. I think that is it's worth spending the almost $300 on the thing. Yeah, they, uh, uh, they have a registration process, I think, syncs up mm -hmm. with, a, uh, with an embedded serial number on the board. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you had to replace a board or something, you have to re-register it. And uh, uh, even their process for uh, making backup uh, micro SD cards is a little... Uh, you might want to do that, not not ever tell them that you need to download and, and re-flash a micro SD card because that process gets really hairy. So I went ahead and backed them up myself. Um, but the Wi-Fi gets flakier as the voltage goes down on a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry, their board will take up to 15 volts on the input. So I run my, I run a boost inverter off my lithium iron phosphate battery to make sure that no matter what the battery voltage is, the input to the Raspberry Pi is at 14.7 volts. Uh, and that, that stabilized things a lot, even for my mount. My mount likes to have uh, more than 12 volts on it too. So, uh, and that, that's one thing I think people run into and don't realize it is they, you know, they carry out these 12 volt battery packs. You start getting around down around 10, 11 volts and things quit working right, especially mounts and uh, other such stuff. So uh, I'll do a thing about battery packs and how to make your own sometime, and what have you, if you like. Hey Rick, we had a question about the total cost for your rig, not just the uh, the Raspberry Pi, but the OTA, the the the, the mount, the tripod, everything. Well, I bought the I bought the mount secondhand, uh, paid uh, eight hundred for it, uh, which was a good deal, until I had to replace the motherboard and one of the drive systems in it. <laughs> but they were flaky, you know, which is, I guess, probably one of the guys sold it. But uh, uh, all in all, it wasn't bad. Uh, the OTA, uh, I think I gave 1100 for it. I bought that brand new. Uh, that's a carbon fiber, rich accretion, uh, eight inch. And uh, uh, the camera, uh, the big camera on the back end, it's a uh, ASI 071. That was about 1500. The little computer was 280. The 120M, M, that, uh, I don't know what those go for now. I, I bought that two or three years ago. I think it was about $200 then. And then the uh, little guide scope was a hundred bucks. Uh, so that's, that's, that's about it. Uh, the laser pointer was 20. <laughs> Got to have the laser pointer. Oh yeah. Got to have the laser pointer. And we had another question here. Uh, what is better, uh, an off access guider or guide scope setup like you have? I have both, but was told that my long focal length, I needed a AOG, a, uh, OAG, I'm sorry. OAG is off axis guider, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm, so, so I'm not the, a guiding expert. Uh, uh, I can't, honestly, I don't understand why the one would make a difference over the other, but I bet Merrill has some input on that. I think Merrill uses off axis on his. 
Well, mine's built into the camera. It's got a dual chip. And so it's it just picks, it has a mirror pick part of the, the stream off. The longer the focal length, the less number of stars you have to choose from. That's that's my biggest issue. Um, so the shorter the focal length, you got a lot, a lot more choice. What, one thing I was showing you, Rick, when you were here, the rotator makes allows me to ro rotate the camera to a place where I have a good, really good guy star. Yeah, that's that, that would be the way I ask the question. The longer the focal length, the less less options you have. Which is why I would think you uh, an off-axis guider wouldn't be that much more beneficial. You use a separate guide scope with a wider field of view, you can pick a lot, lot more star choices, right? Correct. Yep. When you have resolution problems, then because you know, you're, you're going to have a small movement that gets amplified a lot. Right. The longer focal length lets you get off. Uh, less because yep. you're zoomed in closer on your guide star and the other aspect of it is the yeah. pixel size on your guide camera the smaller the pixel size the better your guiding is going to be but if you have a 2,000 meter 2,000 millimeter focal length on your telescope and you're trying to guide it with a 240 millimeter guide scope it's going to get off quite a bit before the guide scope says hey you got to get back on that makes sense that makes sense. That that's what I was told. That's that's the reason I went with the off, the off axis guider, because my my telescope is two thousand thirty two millimeters, and with the the guide camera and scope that you have, Rick, my focal length is way off. Well, again, and my intention is not to do long exposures ever. I mean, I'm I, I will I'll play with it, but. But mine is, uh, I'm, I'm, if I, if I have to expose more than a minute, I'm going to lose audience. You know, my, my intention is to share this with kids and show them what we're looking at. So, two or three minutes exposures, five minute maybe uh, at the most. Way too much. Yeah. So, we'll see. Well, I got a question for you, Rick. If, if you got your, if, when you got your air pro going, how can you? Do you do a live shot? Can you actually see what the camera's? Yeah, it's, it's got looking a looking at, or you have to take exposures. You can no, it's got what they call preview mode, and you can tell it how long is an exposure to take, and it'll do it and pop it up there. You can tell it to do that continuously, so it'll just cycle through preview shots uh, until. And, and that's what I do when I'm trying to focus, you know, rough focus the camera. I just put it in live in a, in a preview mode where it's uh, just continuously recycling to shoot frames and show them on the screen. A question for Merrill, actually. Merrill, does longer focal length guide better if you have the stars? You're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. I think what the reason, I mean, I have three different focal length telescopes and I decide what kind of, and I do it in cycles of six months or a year at a time. What, do I want to have narrow field of view or a very large field of view? So, depends on the object. I'm sorry? Depends on the object you're shooting. Yes, right now I'm using my 14-inch uh, Mead with a uh, uh, focal reducer, optic lepus, uh, that gives me about 2,500 uh, millimeters. And um, so it's pretty pretty narrow field of view, but that my Tagahashi 470, it's very, very broad. So I'm not sure I'm answering the question. What was, the, <laughs> was, it, was the question about guiding? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, somebody brought about the, the pixel size. There is a formula that you can calculate the pixel size, the focal length of the guide scope with what you have, you're taking the, the main image with, and it has to be within a certain ratio, ratio or it doesn't control well. Like Mike, Mike Rourke was saying, um, I think that's what you, you were saying. 
So does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Does long focal length guide better if you have the stars? And and I think the general answer to that is yes, yes. right? The longer the focal length and, and the smaller the pixels, the better the guiding is going to be. Oh, it depends on the scene, too. If the scene is... Well, that's what you said, if you have the stars. Then you will chase in the scene and they will, it will never guide good. Oh, yeah, that's right. Seeing is a, will kill you. Scintillation will knock you right out. I'm, I'm attempting to guide right now, and the clouds are coming in, unfortunately. And I was down to my A08 was guiding at two-tenths of a second image, imaging, and perfect until now, just now the clouds are killing me. Somebody needs to invent a cloud filter. You'll be filthy rich. <laughs> what was that cloud gun somebody uh yes i posted that <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be careful with that one go ahead with that cloud gun <laughs> all right does anybody have any other questions for rick or just any questions in general um i've got a few otherwise i got a few more here Heard a rule of thumb that the guide scope focal length should be some fraction, i.e., one third the imaging scope focal length. Is that about right? Well, as uh, you know, that, that may be true if you are using film, but with the uh, new technologies on guiding, uh, you, you can guide the uh, uh, a big telescope like uh, uh, Merrill has. With a with a small uh, guide scope uh, and guide, okay, a hundred millimeter or something like that will be enough because the technology for detecting uh, transients between pixels is has improved, especially with, by example, PhD two. That is one of the guiding programs, most free programs that everybody uses. And uh, in my case, I use a William Optics one hundred and twenty five millimeters. And uh, I can use my CA that is uh, 2,032 millimeters, and it guides perfectly. Round stars. Also, the latest version of PhD2, the uh, beta version, does multi-star guiding. So it'll pick several stars to guide on and watch them all. That's good. All right, I got another question that just came in here. I'll go ahead and read it. So the question is, my Orion came with a 10 millimeter lens. That's the closest I can use to see objects in the sky. Would a five millimeter or one less than 10 millimeter be effective in seeing objects closer, assuming there's enough reflective light on them? So I'm not sure which Orion um, they've got, but uh, in general, uh, anything smaller than 10 millimeter, anything shorter than 10 millimeter eyepieces are generally uh, more difficult to use and see anything. Uh, our seeing isn't good enough for those most of the time. I've got a high end four millimeter Nagler that I bought as an experiment because I love my nine, right? My nine millimeter Nagler is my favorite eyepiece and in all my telescopes. And I it, I don't ever use it. it it's just- it's, Too much. It's, it's too much, right? So uh, you, you're going for, you're trying to go for magnification. It's just not really there in most cases. Now it depends on the telescope, of course, but uh, uh, that's that's been my experience with with several different ones. So yeah, if you a magnification if you put that in a if you put that in an eighty five millimeter telescope, it isn't. I mean, it looks nice at times. I, I can see it with a big uh, Cassegrain like yours. Uh, it may not work too well, but with the smaller scopes, that eyepiece would probably look good. I've got a a thirteen inch Dob f four point five Dob and. Uh, it's 
<laughs> it doesn't do anything good. All right. I'm going to go ahead and um, got a couple of other um, questions to share here. Now, Brian is on tonight. He's done some landscape astrophotography, which is actually an area that I'd be interested in learning a little bit more about. And that's kind of where you begin, my understanding. Don't necessarily jump right into deep sky and get yourself a full rig, but um, camera on a tripod, get used to using that, do some landscape astrophotography to get your feet wet and kind of grow into the hobby. So Brian, um, if you're, feel free at any time to, to chime in. And if you want to do your demo, I know you've got some camera issues, so we can go ahead and, and uh, skip over that. But if you'd like to do it, just either, you know, just either butt in or shoot me a text and uh, we'll go forward. So it's totally your call. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here. So Brian, yeah, Brian's done some beautiful images, so. Okay, so this one came in. Um, I've been looking at the astronomy.tools website, specifically the CCD suitability calculator. One of the selections in the calculator is to, uh, to pick is the seeing conditions. There are selectors for exceptional seeing, good seeing, okay seeing, poor seeing, very poor seeing. And I would probably go ahead and add um, an exceptionally poor seeing. That is Memphis. So anyway, um, since this affects the cameras that people buy, my question is, what is the typical seeing in the Memphis area? I think we just answered that question. Within Memphis slash uh, Bartlett city limits at Burton Sugar Farm and at Village Creek, I'm assuming that we will never see the excellent seeing, but maybe the good seeing or the average seeing. What are the other members... Uh, what have other members based their camera selections on uh, that you will be using to imaging in the local area and not take your telescope to Hawaii, et cetera, assuming that you will not be taking it to Hawaii, but you're doing it in the local area? So I, I got a couple of comments about that. One of them is we have actually had excellent seeing, and we can get it from time to time. It's not common here, but we do get it. What we suffer from more than seeing is bad transparency. Uh, and and that comes from so much water vapor in the air mostly. And then of course there's light pollution. Uh, but uh, seeing is all about, mo no, seeing is not all about, seeing is mostly about <clears throat> laminar airflow in the upper atmosphere. If you've got good steady air um, moving not calm, but steady moving. Uh, you, you've got a chance of having decent seeing. Yeah, and Freddie, I think you actually made this comment as well. I mean, Memphis is the hub of FedEx. So <laughs> we get a lot of jets. 500 planes a day. Yeah. So it's a little bit like John Kerry, right? He's now the new, what is it, chairman of the environmental committee, and he's got the private jet with all the, the fumes. So... I don't know if we have one plane after another that goes out over overnight, uh, whether the fumes from the uh, from the FedEx jets would affect the seeing conditions because you need to see the transparency. Oh, transparency. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you are uh, taking a picture of something and a plane passes through, uh, that will that will affect your seeing too. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So yeah, I have just, lots, so on that I have lots of those. Yeah. On I that site about. that was just mentioned, I just had seen that, you know, picking the camera based on the the I guess the pixel size of the camera, uh, that comes into play in that particular uh calculator that was just on the screen too. Well, there is an issue. Uh, the uh, pixel size is not something you can choose, you know, for, for a variety. You have 3, 3.5, 4, 5.5. Yeah. There is not much variation between those. So just, just try to pick the one that suits better your telescope. 
and guess the scene is good. All right. You know, there's if, when you're talking about astronomy specific cameras, not taking your DSLR and hooking it up to a telescope, you, you, you've got a couple of choices. I've chosen to go with color cameras, right? That means that my resolution is always going to be bad because, uh, you know, every, uh, every group of four pixels is a, is a, uh, uh, a red a blue and two greens, two greens. and uh <clears throat> so and uh, that's the if you want to do the real high resolution images you want the real nice quality images you get a a black and white camera a monochrome camera i use filters. Take a bunch of frames at different with different color filters and add the color up later of course, what I want to do is live viewing. So I want to be able to show color where there is color in live mode. So that's a, that's the difference. Uh, you got you need to make that decision uh, when you get started. But like I said, if you're in this for taking pictures, you want high resolution pictures, then you really don't want a color camera. And I'll go ahead and just. We have to take a lot more frames. Uh, yes. To, to make up for it. At least three times more. All right. And just kind of wrapping up this question, um, I will go ahead and just mention this. So, most of you are, we probably use this. Uh, this is, of course, the Astrospheric um, app. You can download it for free on your phone. I know many of us probably use this, but uh, just, to just go ahead and mention it. This is a good app for um, for planning. I mean, or, or for seeing the, the the conditions, whether it's seeing um, cloud cover or transparency. And uh, of course, you can see tomorrow night for our regularly scheduled observing session, we've got all white. White is bad. Blue is good. <laughs> Can't be worse. <laughs> yeah. So. As far as um, a good app, are there, are there any others anybody wants to mention? I use Astrospheric. I know many of you do as well. Are there any others? Well, I, I was mentioning before we got started, uh, Merrill turned me on this website called Ventusky. Uh, and I really like it, mostly for cloud cover. I don't look at it so much for seeing. Uh, here, let me share the screen real quick. Well, he's found out I use clear outside. So um, you get a radar screen, you get uh, satellite uh, imagery, and just cloud coverage. And this does uh, predictions. So this shows us at 10 o'clock we'll be a little more covered and by 11 socked in. Uh, you can look at uh, calculations for low, middle, and high clouds. Uh, what, what I always liked about this is the uh, wind flow uh, mm -hmm. that they show. And that can give you some good indications of what the uh, some estimations about seeing and so you can get to a whole lot of different elevations and see what the airflow is like and you can see major differences at 250 meters 100 meters just above the ground it's pretty slow you know the other thing that affects seeing and 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 especially visual observers forget this is that uh, there's a boundary layer uh, when your telescope mirror is uh, equalizing in temperature, whether it's warming up to warm air or cooling down to cold air, you get a boundary layer of turbulence right above the mirror that just makes everything mushy until the uh, mirror gets uh, temperature stabilized. And uh, there you go. 
Yeah, I was just looking at Amarillo while you're doing your talk there and said, man, there's a lot of wind coming from all directions in that place. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Tusky. Jeremy, to answer your question about the ones I use is a clear sky chart and a clear outside chart. And I kind of compare both of them. They usually pretty much agree, but not always. And that's which is a different one than the ast astrophoric that you shared. This one we've had, I've used this for a long time, and this one's on. Uh, that's what I use. Yeah. And I've always, you know, Bill Bustler always bad mounted. I, you know, it's cloud cover predictions are, I, I don't know, plus or minus, but I've always. Uh, thought their seeing predictions were right on the money. And uh, transparency seems pretty accurate as well. And you look at these, you want to look at the detailed maps, uh, the seeing map, you go here and you can see what it looks like. And you can go back in time on these. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be... Uh, Zulu, three Zulu, oh, seven, and then oh, seven, <laughs> that's three hours earlier, 21. So it's, it's in three hour increments. You can back up and look where they're, where they're going. So, same way okay. for each one of these. There's yeah. a cloud cover map. So anyway. Yeah, I use this one a lot because I remember memphisastro.org and that's, I know it's right at the top. <laughs> <laughs> it is there. By the way, uh, here's a little preview. Uh, our our uh, Steve has really done a great job with our uh, updated website. We're working on it, hopefully to have it ready to uh, to go live pretty soon so Neat. looks nice yeah yeah i think it's gonna be pretty cool time to start cracking the whip so we can get this done you know it seems like no matter how much i pay steve he just works on it whenever he feels like it you know? <laughs> i don't know man we gotta have a we gotta have a private conversation hard to get good help these days i know it is Pretty excited though once this gets launched. All right, um, let me go ahead here. Okay, this one came in. How does using narrow band filters affect camera settings and taking calibration frames? Uh, <clears throat> Your calibration, the only calibration frames that should can be uh, affected is your uh, your flats. Uh, <clears throat> it won't affect the darks or the bias, but the darks, what well, the flats will be affected because that is the light path. Yeah, you need a set of flats for each each filler. All right. So, uh, so you're saying if you're shooting all your colors, right? Your luminance, red, blue, and green, and then if you're using any uh, hydrogen alpha or O3 or anything like that, you shoot those all separately. Yes, sir. and you yeah. need to have flats for each of those. Yeah. Uh, okay. Zero band take a lot longer to to uh, to accumulate the exposure because they put less light through. Oh, force. Okay. Um, um, Meryl, yeah. Meryl, when you uh, do your mono camera in the filters, do you usually, like, you go to the red filter and then take, you know, 20 or 40 frames and then go to the next one, or do you take, like, two or three and then shift to the next one and, and go around? Uh, like that. <laughs> well, I, yeah, my I have what I use is CCD Commander. It's the kind of the shell that controls everything. Uh, and I normally do my my overall target is thirty to four hours, thirty to 
30 to 40 hours of exposure. And most of that's going to be luminance. And so I'll get 20 hours of luminance, five, out, five minute exposures. And then, then they'll get a couple hours of each of the red, green, and blue. And then if, if it's a good hydrogen alpha, I'll get several hours. Of that. That's, that's the hydrogen alpha is just beautiful stuff. The, the, the amount of detail it shows. So you put them all together. I, so I do, I typically <clears throat> try and do tonight, and then the clouds have moved in. I'm farther north than you guys are, um, and the clouds have already shut me down. But um, I will I will take days worth of, of um, limits before I do anything else. Okay. I, red, green, and blue, I just, you know, a couple, couple three hours of each, and that's all I need. That was my last uh, Orion before the clouds moved in. <laughs> That's just a 10 second exposure, no filters. So I'm gonna try some broadband filters just to cut the light pollution down, but uh, we'll see where that go from there. Yeah, and the guidance started to fail there. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, does anybody have any other questions? If not, I, I'm sure people have got some questions about equipment. And I did want to cover a couple of uh, slides on that, but I'll open it up here for just a second. Earl, uh, when using the uh, red, green, blue filters, some people bin it two by two. Do you do that? Just take your luminance at one by one and the colors at two by two, or do you just not worry about it? I've tried it both ways. Uh, it's just easier to do uh, in one by one, to me anyway. Now I will do if I do plate solvings. It I'll do, I'll, I'll, usually three bin, a bit three by three, but because it just gives a crisper image to plate solve, but. Oh, that's one by one. So I got a message here. Gentlemen and ladies, thank you so much for allowing a stranger to be invited to your meeting. How fortunate you are to have such a group. A blessing indeed. Steve Jacobs, Chief Scientist, National Geographic. Well, thank you, Steve. I'm glad you took uh -oh. to stop in. <laughs> hmm. That's credentials. Yeah, I don't think we've had a scientist from National Geographic. I hope you come back. Um, He's thank here. you for taking the time to. Yeah, there he is. There he is. No, uh, Michael. Uh, can you hear me? Michael uh, Lewis invited me. Oh. Uh, see, Michael, I told you they would smile. <laughs> I told you. And they say, bunch of rough looking group. <laughs> we, <laughs> we are. I know. And I want to thank you. I, I worked for uh, Don Herbert, Mr. Wizard. For 25 years i'm an old chemistry professor so i'm just i'm soaking up astronomy Excellent. And, uh, michael said well come watch these guys They'll, you'll learn some stuff and i did <laughs> wow somebody from national geographic magazine learning something from the memphis astronomical society right well you can help me out i that's our purpose yeah listen, that's your purpose i'm i need to make a beautiful a spectrum with a with a prism and I'm a chemist and I don't know, I, I'm trying to figure out the slit and the light source. So what do I do? I'll put that, see, there's a question. You guys are all. Um, you, you want, you want, uh, you want to show the spectral lines of a given element? No, I just, this is for, you this is for. Full yeah. spectrum. Yeah, full spectrum. Yeah, so just get, uh, 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 yeah, you need sunlight and uh, so a slit and a, in a window shade or a piece of cardboard and yeah, run that window. so explain the slit to me uh you just just a uh, narrow slit and uh it could be uh uh 16th 18th of an inch wide get your piece of cardboard up in front of a window and then have a piece of white poster board uh that you uh use to project the 
uh, the spectrum on to. And, and the slit's just going to give you, it yeah. doesn't have to be a split, a slit, but it'll, it'll give you more distinction in the. Uh, yeah, I've seen them. I've seen them at the Smithsonian. They're just beautiful. They had a, a, a projector that shot through a lens and then it went through a slit. And yeah. A beautiful spectrum. And I'm having trouble getting a nice one, you know. I can get a little one. Well, I'll work on it. Yeah. I First step, man. Excellent. Oh, I thank you so much for letting me visit. Hey, we're happy to have you. Thank you so much for, for joining our meeting. Well, I will. And I'll, I'll tell my boss I need, what's your dues a year, 500? I'll tell the boss I need some money. <laughs> ah, there <laughs> there you go. Mr. Jacobs, it, it was uh, nice of you to stop by. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad that these ge nice gentlemen allowed me to invite you. Uh, well, they were, a lot nicer than, they were a lot nicer than you described, Michael. <laughs> I thought you people would all have square heads and a horn, you know, and here you are, this guy. So we're unusually well behaved tonight. This is not normally how we are. Normally it's a you know, it's an all-out brawl. All right. No, I like this group. This this yeah, this is a good group. Hang with Thank you. Thank you. Right, well, thank thank you. you. Get out of here. You bet. Uh Brian. Um how are we looking? Can you can you do your um your demo? Well, I can just hold the equipment up to the uh, webcam. My other camera's not working, so. All right. So, um, but um, basically, I just wanted to show you a um, couple pieces of equipment. And um, I'm sure most of you have heard that the BAS telescope is the one that you use the most. And, uh, and I think uh, astrophotography is a little bit similar. The BAS camera as the one that you use the most. So um, that's one reason I like DSLRs and just shooting on a tripod. Um, and when I do use a tracker, usually I just use this little Polari. I wouldn't suggest buying this new. This is about 300 bucks new. And, and right now for four or $500, you can get um, trackers that come with a lot of extras that this doesn't have. But what I really like about this tracker is um, if you compare it to a camera, it's actually quite a bit smaller than a camera. It fits in your bag and uh, you can go out, take some you know, wide field exposures. Um, you don't have to have any cables. Um, you just throw it in your camera bag and, uh, and you're done. So I'm gonna share a couple of pictures that I've taken with this, but um, uh, there's at the front, you, you connect your ball head. Like I said, sorry, I don't have the other camera for this. It's fine. But you connect this at the front and then at the bottom, if you wanted, to make it even lighter, you could connect another ball head, especially if you're shooting uh, 50 millimeters and under, and um, you could connect that to the tripod and you're ready to go. This, um, give me a second, let me share a screen. The first picture I'm gonna show you, uh, give me one second. Is that showing up? Uh, <clears throat> no. Yeah, I, mean, I see you. We, we see we see the um, the folder with the with the folder. The yes, correct. <laughs> see the thumbnail, not the picture. Wrong screen. Uh, I think that the picture is to your right. I think you. Still no good. No. Hmm. Have you that got two that. screens, Brian? Okay, let's uh, move it up. Sorry, guys, give me a second. Take your time. There you there go. There it is. Ah, excellent. Beautiful. Yeah, it is something. 
So this is actually without a polarium, just camera and tripod. And, um, and uh, we were camping at um, Bruno State Park, um, south of Boise, Idaho. And what I really like about just taking single images, this is a single image, and, um, and I spent about, I don't know, two or three minutes on Photoshop, just uh, adjusting the levels and the color. And if, if you're thinking about getting into astrophotography, I really suggest you do start out with just camera and tripod and uh, take some photos like this. Now, this photo is a little bit easy because it's a Bortle two sky. Um, it's a little bit difficult to um, take a single image like this from the city. But, um, you know, if you just get a DSLR and a tripod, uh, you're going to save a lot of money, and then you can figure out whether you like astrophotography or not. And it's it's a good, just, you know, no hassle way to get into astrophotography. Um, the second thing I suggest you do once you get your camera and tripod is, let me, sorry, guys, it's been so long since I used Zoom. I, uh, I got what I'm doing. Brian, somebody's asking uh, how long was exposure? That is a, um, if, if I remember correctly, I shot it with the 24 millimeter lens. It is a 20 second exposure and the ISO was 3200, I believe. Now the, um, The second thing I suggest you get once you have your uh, camera lens is get a fog filter. These things are really cool for, they bring the stars out and they also add color to your image. The um, fog filters are a lot of fun and let's try another one here. Wow. Nice. Okay. So this is, um, Wonderful. this is a shot actually from Belize. And, um, and again, it's a Bortle two sky. So it's, a uh, it's kind of cheating a little bit. Again, you're not going to get a single exposure like that from the city. And, um, and you probably wouldn't get that from Burton's either. Uh, you, you can see there's almost no light pollution, um, on the horizon. But um, again, this is similar settings. With a fog filter, you have to be a little bit more careful with your ISO settings. And you have to be a little bit more careful with your exposures because what'll happen is the stars, you know, you, you can even see that Betelgeuse is starting to get a little oversaturated and, um, and the size of the stars start getting a little bit too exa exaggerated. And, um, and so this one, you know, probably I should have uh, lowered the ISO a little bit more. But again, this is just camera, tripod, fog filter, um, and I wasn't using the Polari. Um, for the, um, uh, the other important thing about the lens is you definitely want to get the fastest lens that you can. The, um, the lens that I have is a Samyang and it's a uh, um, it's f 1.2. Really? So wow. A really That's a fast lens. It's <laughs> shot wide open, and so you can 
if you start to look at the stars carefully, you can see that, you know, it's, it, that's actually not trailing, that's distortion. In the, the, of the lens, yes. Yeah. And then the uh, last one I want to show you is uh, one that I use the Polari for. And hopefully it won't take me five minutes to show you this one. Hey, Brian, how many millimeters is the lens? 24 millimeters. For the actual DSR, is a super wide angle lens. F1.2. what? F1.2. 1.2? Yes. Sorry, 1.4. Oh, OK. 1.2 is the fastest lens they have produced, I think. I haven't seen anything faster than that. Uh, there is too much distortion on the edges. Sorry, right, guys, I'm having a problem getting back to you. No worries. Hey, Brian, the foreground's not illuminated in the last in that last image, is it? Yeah, he did. He, oh, he did. Flashed it or something. Yeah. No, so, um, so I, I'll tell you what was going on there. Um, actually, the uh, resort we were staying at, at, they had it lit up like Christmas. So uh, those were I. They said they were worried about uh, jaguars in the area. And so they uh, they had everything lit up there. All right, maybe I can. Nice. OK, and so this last one was uh, Neo Wise. Now, I did use a Polari for this. And um, this is a uh, stack of uh, 10 uh, 45 second exposures. And you, so you can see you get some um, trailing from with the clouds and stuff, but I didn't care. So that's the problem with landscape photography with a Polari is once you start taking a 45 second or a one minute exposure then um of course it's going to attract the sky and then you're and then the landscape is going to be blurry right. there is a setting on the polari where you can do half the sidereal rate so and that'll allow you to do about 30 seconds and the you know then the trailing for the stars is minimal you probably won't notice unless you zoom in and the and the landscape will look pretty good. Uh, it, it still won't be as sharp as if you know you did a shorter exposure. So um, uh, that's basically it, guys. With the I, if if you want to get a Polari, I recommend you just uh, get one on cloudy nights or Astro Mart. You can pick them up used for about one fifty, and that's a much better deal than buying it new. But you can buy the. Uh, the the Polari doesn't come with a polar scope, and um, and it doesn't come with um, uh, I don't believe it comes with any ball heads, and so once you start throwing in the counterweights and the ball heads, you can easily get up to seven eight hundred bucks, and it, I mean at that price point, you might as well buy an uh, equatorial mount. Oh, wow, right? And, How do you spell that? Gets ridiculous. Yeah. But um, if you're wanting something small and portable that will allow you to take wide field images, um, in my opinion, I've got some other trackers. I just feel like the Polari, just for portability, it, it can't be beat. How, how do you spell that? It's a P-O-L-A-R-I-E. And it's made by Vixen. I see it. Thanks. Yeah. Vixen, uh, all of their products are overpriced. And um, <laughs> the the Polari included. Wow. Anybody have any other questions for Brian? So speaking of Orion, uh, Betelgeuse made the news the past year because of the great dimming. And if anybody's caught the March issue of Sky and Telescope magazine, 
um, an article on the great dimming of Betelgeuse was featured on the cover. And the guy who wrote that article would be speaking for the for our meeting in April, April 9. So mark your calendars. The guy who wrote the article on the great dimming of Betelgeuse will be speaking for the Memphis Astronomical Society in, on April the 9th for our April meeting. So that's my shameless marketing plug for the moment. <laughs> okay. Good job, by the way, getting him to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Freddie's making a great VP of programs. I tell you, <laughs> it's all about the support. That's one thing I learned. Um, so I'm, I'm sure some of you guys have some questions about equipment. And there's a couple guys on the, on the call tonight. And I want to kind of take advantage of their expertise while they're here. And, um, and really just kind of show you what's possible with this hobby. So let me just go ahead and share my screen here. So um, we have, uh, let me see here. Now, Brent is, um, he was on the call. I don't know if he's still on, but Brent got into this hobby a few years ago. We, we have started or we're in the process of starting a, um, an astrophotography focus group. And this is really Rick's, um, really Rick's group. And he's also started a, a Slack channel. And there's a lot of very interesting and powerful information and dialogue going on there. But um, Brent's been in this hobby for a few years now. He basically listed um, the equipment that he uses for his entire rig. And he shot some really cool images right in Olive Branch, Mississippi. So I want to just go ahead and list this here. And um, you can kind of see, of course, if you're on the Slack channel, you've already seen this. Some of you may have the same, some of these, these uh, same pieces of equipment, but you can see here, he basically breaks down the mount that he uses, Skywatcher EQ6R Pro mount, the scopes, the William Optics, and then he's also got an Explore Scientific, the ZWO camera, um, the filters, the, uh, the guiding, the William Optics 850 millimeter guiding scope with 1.25 inch roto lock, and then also some of the additional equipment here. So. And uh, you can see there's a lot of pieces, a lot of moving parts. You just kind of slowly build this over time. But um, this just kind of gives you a snapshot. It's a very, it's a nice rig. Very, it's a very portable rig. Roll this in, roll this out from your driveway. He does all of his stuff from, uh, again, from, from basically his home in Olive Branch. And, uh, you know, eventually he'll get to a dark sky site and then kind of see what's, uh, what's possible. I just want to throw this out there and Anybody has any questions or comments? Now's the time. Again, for those of you who are part of the group, the uh, the astrophotography focus group, a lot of great information. Well, let me let me throw out too that uh, our next meeting, our next Zoom meeting, will be Saturday night, the twentieth. What I've done is tried to schedule a uh, basically a seven to nine p.m. Zoom call. Uh, on the Saturday nights near the new, uh, not the new moon, the full moon. So the next one will be on the 20th. Um, and it'll be, uh, it's open to the, open to anybody that wants to, to join and, and ask questions. I've, you know, the, the idea is to, is to get the learners with the teachers. You know, that's, that's what I, uh, that was my whole objective. Try to get people on that, uh, uh, can share tips and tricks between themselves as experts and then uh, help guide uh, new people that are uh, uh, diving into this for the first time, uh, answer questions. So uh, that'll be coming up again on the 20th. And then we set up a uh, Slack chat group. Uh, if you're interested in uh, following that, then uh, send me an email and I will send you an invitation. It's by invitation only. Uh, we don't want to open up to the public uh, because we share stuff like phone numbers and everything else so that we can get in touch with each other. So it's uh, uh, not open to the public. Uh, but my email address is ric at memphisastro.org. 
And uh, here you can see some pictures that Brent has taken with his rig. This, this one was taken just a couple of weeks ago of the Orion Nebula. And uh, this one was actually featured on the High Point Scientific Facebook page in just a couple of days ago. So I want to give a shout out to Brent, doing great work, really appreciate it. And of course, a lot of his pictures are on our Facebook group as well. And uh, here's one of the double cluster that he took. Nice. And this one is one of my favorites. I love this one. We used this for the star party last fall. One of the star parties, I think it was a September star party. You can see the lagoon and trifid, which of course are, are summer and early fall targets. Love this image. So from my main man, Brent Ellis, doing great work. Love it. <laughs> Very good. Now, if you really want to up your game, <laughs> we got our man, Merrill Miller, who has a sky shed. And hey, when you're retired and you're a successful DuPont engineer, what better use of your time than to build an observatory in your backyard? Procter & Gamble, by the way. Uh, Procter, I'm sorry, Procter & Gamble. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, Procter & Gamble. So here you can see a couple of pictures of his setup. And he added the dome, I think, uh, was that August or September? September. September. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, mid-September. And Merrill's objective is to be able to control his observatory from anywhere in the world. And you can see a, a snapshot here from his desk. And then also he listed his equipment on our Slack channel. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think his objective is to control his telescope. I, I think he's got broader vision than that. There's to, to control the whole world. This is there world domination. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'm list. Yeah, I just want to list this here. Anybody has any questions for Merrill? This would be a great time. Um, and again, this is on our Slack channel as well. And uh, he's got quite a setup, uh, very impressive. And he's taken some impressive images also. So, and he has a Flickr channel and you can see several of his images. This one is the Crescent Nebula. And I'll just show you the link here to his, um, his Flickr page. Really cool image. And then also the Cocoon. And we featured this one in the October Star Party, the uh, Tennessee Virtual Star Party. So this is the Cocoon Nebula. So a lot of really great images that uh, Merrill has taken with his setup. So really just wanted to mention that. I'm going to go ahead and open it up here. Um, anybody has any other comments or questions or anything else that we need to cover? My head's stopping up. I think I'm about done. All right. Scott, how are you feeling? Scott got his second uh, uh, COVID uh shot today oh we did yeah. uh, I, I have done better uh, sorry <laughs> but i'm ha but i'm uh happy to have have it out of the way yeah congratulations yeah moderna apparently is worse than pfizer oh the moderna one is worse than pfizer as far for as second for the impact I've, I've had more people that have been on pfizer that had no reaction and moderna almost everyone has had a reaction and I think it's because there's a uh, three times as much mRNA material in the Moderna dose. So, but I know it's working. How's that? I know it's working. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's good. So, well, great. Um, I am going to go ahead and wrap up here. If nobody has any other questions or comments, um, let's see here. Yeah, oh, I suspect yeah. I will have it in the months ahead. I'll have more questions, but I'm just getting my head around how everything works. Okay. So, I mean, it's a, a whole nother realm. There's a lot of information. Um, it's, it's a journey, definitely, right? Anybody who's done this for a while, this is, there, there, there is no destination with this hobby. It's, it's a journey more than a destination. So uh, with that, just kind of show our information. Let's see here. Do we have any other, any other uh, questions? So that's about it. Um, again, if you want to join our our email distribution list, go to go to joinmas.com. 
we will send an email out regarding the next astrophotography focus group meeting that's coming up toward the end of the month. So if you're on our email list, you will get um, you will get a notice regarding the next astrophotography meeting. Again, it'll be a Zoom call. Rick sponsors it. So join MAS.com if you're not on our email list already. Just put that up there. And again, we've got links to the sky chart for February as well as the membership application in the video below. And with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will see you next month, actually four weeks from today. March the 5th is our next meeting. So have a great month, stay healthy, and we'll see you guys in four weeks. Have a All great right. night. Good night.